that's also what we're looking for. We're looking for great art, but we also don't want to care more than you do. Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Words of Fang, inter another interview from the Between the Waves Music Festival. If you're watching this, you missed it, but you can always come to next year. It's in June. Check out btwmadison.com. And if you want all of the interviews completely uncut from the Between the Waves Festival, all 500 or however many we're doing, go to patreon.com slash lords of the trident, sign up for just a buck and you will get not only that, but a bunch more content as well. And today, we are sitting down with the amazingly fantastic Emily White. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm great. All right. I'm very happy to be here. All right. So for, for everyone out there who is not familiar with you, for what you do, and all the stuff you're involved in, give us, give us the rundown. Sure. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, first and foremost. Um, I'm based in New York City. I'm originally from Wisconsin. I run, a, run an entertainment firm called Collective Entertainment. Mm -hmm. We manage musicians and... <coughs> Athletes, as I lose my voice right before I do my presentation <laughs> next, um, I have a nonprofit called Hashtag I Voted, where we activated over <clears throat> 150 venues on Election Day in 2018 to let fans in who showed a selfie from outside their polling place. Um, we had countless national acts playing, um, and we're definitely going to do the same thing in 2020. And it was definitely inspired by um, being from Wisconsin and, you know, the the vote tally being, I should memorize it, but in the presidential election, it was like a 22,000 vote difference. And I thought, I'm dating myself a little bit, but I thought, that's the Bradley Center. Mm. Why don't we throw a sick concert and somehow tie in voting? And I realized if we took the concept national that it would have that much more impact. So that's how I voted was born. And finally, I'm an author. Um, my first book is called Interning 101. My second book is out this summer. It's a long title, but the pre-orders have been great. So we're going to keep it how to build a sustainable music career and yeah. collect all revenue streams. That's amazing. Thank wow. You. So, so, you know, you don't stay busy at all, basically. It's crazy, <laughs> but all good stuff. Well, what was the, so I guess I, I have to ask, how did you get into this line of work? What was the, what was the impetus behind saying, okay, I want to go into this, this sort of management and this sort of, you know, book writing, all that sort of stuff. Where did that come from? I definitely set out to do it. Um, I think, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, set out to be in the music industry for sure. Wow. Um, I think there were there was twice and two times I realized I could do that as a teenager yeah. when, in Wisconsin. Um, maybe the first time was I was probably in about sixth grade and I was seeing R.E.M. at the Marcus Amphitheater. Mm. And, I, and this is not why people should get in music, but I saw people standing on the side of the stage and I'm, I was like, well, those are people. I'm people. I want. I'm a person. I want to stand there, you know. And and um, and then I found Don Passman's book at Brookfield Square Mall when I was probably 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. um, now I work with Don to write the marketing chapters on the newest version of that book. You know, all wow. you need to know about the music business. And Don has kindly um, done a blurb for my new book out this summer. So um, those are just some kind of Wisconsin tidbits, but. I studied music business at Northeastern University in Boston, definitely set out to do it, did tons of internships and went from there. That's amazing. Wow. Thanks. There, there's, there's so many people that I've interviewed that have said, you know, well, I was, th was going to yeah. be a teacher and then, you know, this, this thing came along and it blew up. But I think you're the first person that I've talked to who said, no, I, I knew I wanted to do it from square yeah. one and I went and did it. And I was probably, That's amazing. yeah, like kind of one of the first generations to do that because anyone older than maybe, and I'm, I don't mean to generalize, but maybe some of the people you've talked to, yeah. you know, used to say things like, oh, you know, studying music business, I just did this and I did that. And, um, <laughs> you know, now I'm, I'm going to teach a class at NYU this fall. I taught a class at Hofstra this year. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's countless music business students. So, and I, I mean, I was in college 20 years ago at this point or whatever. So, wow. Very cool. All right. Well, let's, let's dive right into it with a big question. Um, some people have told me, some musician friends have told me that now is the worst time to be in the music industry, the music business. And some people have told me now is the best time to be yeah. in the music industry. For you, what is it? What, and and, and where, where, you know, can you extrapolate on that Absolutely. a little bit? Absolutely. It's definitely the best mm. because the big, the, the difference between the current music industry and back in the day is basically digital and brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. um, artists can record from anywhere in the world now, hotel room, bedroom, whatever. That was not the case in the pre-digital era. Um, you would basically have to work with a record company because studios were so, so expensive. So unless mm -hmm. you were a one percenter, you wouldn't have access to that. 
And the other difference is artists now have access to worldwide distribution. And mm. that was definitely what labels held the keys to in the pre-digital era. So anyone can record, anyone can distribute, anyone can market yourself. So I would ask the people who say it's the worst time to be a musician what they were doing. Were they all signed to majors? And was it all amazing in the 90s? Yeah, um, I don't yeah. think so. So I just love equal opportunity to creating and distributing music. Like, yes, you need to make great art. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how you succeed. But um, it's an incredible time to be, to be a musician. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. Um, so as somebody who, who is knee deep in the industry, if there's something that you could wave a magic wand and get rid of, whether it be from the business side, whether it be from the live side, the recording side, anything, mm -hmm. you know, and just get rid of immediately in the music business, what would it be? Um, for the entertainment and sports industries at large or really any sort of talent, it's not really industry specific. Mm -hmm. My answer to this, and it's always happened and always will, is the elimination of sycophants. Mm. And if people don't know what a sycophant is, it's someone that will um, try to suck up to the talent so much and try to eliminate everyone around them, all the professionals, so they can do it. And it's, you know, it's interesting because the example I used to give would be a, a very, very old film from like the 30s or something called All About Eve. But I saw Bohemian Rhapsody recently. Have you seen it? Yes. Yeah, it was, I, I liked it. Do you know who the sycophant was in that film? Uh, it was probably his first manager, right? Or was it? It was, um, I think, well, I viewed it as like an engineer, but I, when I read it was someone at the record company. Yeah, yeah, So it was yeah, a lover yeah, yeah, yeah. of Freddy's yes, that, that tried guy, to that manipulate um, the manager. That's a sycophant. Oh. So, it, and it's really difficult for the talent to see because it's like, oh my gosh, someone wants to dedicate their life to me and that's so amazing, but mm -hmm. they don't see what's going on around them. So I've seen sycophant situations end in six-figure lawsuits and lots of awful <sighs> things. So I, I know that's probably not really the answer you expected, but no, the, um, it's... The, the great thing is that everybody's been giving various answers. And I think the interesting thing about that answer is, I think as DIY artists and independent artists, we're always told, you know, because we, we have this idea of like, oh, we should find a manager, we should find a booking agent. And we're always told, find the one person who's like hardcore, like dedicated and a friend to your band. And, and, and find them first and have them work for you. And, and you know, part of that answer is, yes, but be careful. And I agree with that advice. Yeah. But the difference is, and this was how I started working with Amanda Palmer and the Dresden Dolls when I was in college, is when I introduced myself to Amanda when they played my school, when the band, when the band played my school, um, I, I said, I'm a music business major. I'm interning at the radio station. I'm interning at um, a local music magazine. Let me know if you ever need help. And my point is, I learned later that Amanda had had offers for help from fans, mm. and I was a fan too, but right. I was on a professional track. So I think the difference is if the person is making you their life, mm -hmm. I know it seems like a great thing, but it's actually really short-sighted. If someone is on a professional path, then it's much more mutually beneficial to have you know friends and family and college students helping you out. So watch out for the weird, creepy boyfriend type is what you're talking about. But again, you don't realize it. It's like, oh my gosh, you're, you want to work for my band 20 hours a day. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs> All right, so as, as, as somebody switching gears a little bit, as somebody who's seen um, a lot of live performances, yeah. who's been to a lot of shows, um, is there something that you see new bands, especially, you know, but maybe, maybe, maybe all bands, doing wrong at live performances or maybe a, a common mistake that a lot of people make at live shows? Absolutely. Uh, not having an email list out to capture data to know who the fans are. Mm. Very simple. That's, that, well, that's an easy one. That's really quick. Okay. I mean, your email list needs to be like part of your gear. Right, right, right. So, okay. Let's say that somebody you know, comes up to you and they say, they say Emily, I, I, I'm, I'm all in on the music industry. Um, I'm an artist. I wanna, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to quit my job, uh, sell my house, live out of a van, go full time. What's the first thing that you'd say to them? Well, everybody wants to do that. Well, yeah, sure. But <laughs> is that <laughs> I, what you say? Yes. OK. Yeah. Okay. So what's the plan? And that's, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Like The first step is make great art. You might mm. want that. Is your art great? Um, and then, yeah, laying the foundation to do that. And I, I swear I'm not like trying to sell books or whatever. Like the reason I wrote both of my books is um, I just was explaining the same things over and over. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I wrote 100 pages on it in, in the new book. And, and I mean, it's literally called How to Build a Sustainable Music Career. So, wow. 
Okay. I don't know if I can sum it. I, mean, I can barely sum it up in 40 minutes. Yeah, next, yeah. So. Well, so I guess, so So check out the book. Where can they find the book? Um, NineGiantStepsBooks.com. NineGiantStepsBook.com. Books, we'll put I the, think. Books, They'll find it. Books, sorry. I'll find it. I'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it down on the, on, the, on the screen at the bottom here. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll make it happen. I want to read this now. Thanks. All right, you talked earlier about the, you know, the new versus the old industry, the brick and mortar versus the mm -hmm. digital age. Uh, is there, are there, are there vestiges of the, the, the quote unquote old industry that you think are still crucial to artists nowadays? Um, you know, something like, you know, be it labels, be it booking agents, be it mm -hmm. managers. Yeah. Is there something that's, that is absolutely still critical for bands in today's age? You know, it's interesting. So in the new book, the first really 11 chapters are like, here's how to do all of this in a methodical order from mm. recording to release. Mm. Chapter 12 is how to get an agent, manager, business manager. Like it's, it's the last step. Hmm. And the reason that's the case is in the modern music industry, and again, like not to be totally arrogant, but in the way I've laid it out, is you can do all this stuff, mm -hmm. and then when it gets too overwhelming, that's when you need to bring in the professionals, because that's also what we're looking for. We're looking for great art, but we also don't want to care more than you do. Mm -hmm. So if we check out you know, your Instagram and you haven't posted in months, you know, what are you doing to promote and, and get, we're not miracle workers, we're human beings. Sure. You know, we're partners with the artists. So if you think hiring all these fancy people is gonna be instant success, well then anyone could do that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think having great partners is key, but you know, ask someone like Zoe Keating. She has a phenomenal career, you know, all by herself, so. That's amazing. Talking about, you know, having posted on Instagram in months is a great segue to my next question which is uh, in, in today's age of, of social media mm -hmm. and, and bands being connected and, and directly connected to their fans, um, do you think that losing some of the mystique mm -hmm. from say back in the 80s or 90s when you couldn't just email a band mm -hmm. or you couldn't mess, go on their Facebook page and message them and potentially talk to one of the members, yeah. is, is, the, is the access a good thing or a bad thing? Is the lack of mystique uh, mm -hmm. something that most bands miss or something that maybe you know, is a overall a negative. I appreciate what you're saying, but it's almost pointless to talk about because it's just not even relevant, right? Sure. So like I've managed artists, they're like, I just wanna be David Bowie and come on and off stage and not meet fans and not this, and those artists' careers didn't go very well. Mm. So we can all pine for back in the day, but this is the reality, and I'm sorry, like if you don't wanna connect with the audience, you know, your audience is your career, your fans are your lifeblood. So if you want mystique, I, I don't know, it just sounds like kind of an asshole thing <laughs> if I could swear on YouTube. You, you so, can. Yeah. YouTube has no rules. There's no right. rules. <laughs> I, and I get it. Like, it's not in everyone's comfort zone, but, you know, I've definitely worked with artists, um, you know, where we figure out ways that work for them. So, mm -hmm. and again, it's like, even if you want that mystique, you would have had to know how to sign to a label and all that. So sure. it's, it's, it's better now, I promise. Okay. All right, last question. Is there a, do you have a favorite tip or trick and I know that your new book is going to be absolutely chock full of them. But is there, a, you know, you talk, you've talked at a few, at, at this conference a number of times. I'm sure you've talked at multiple conferences. Is there a favorite tip or trick that you share with bands that you're like, okay, this is my signature? I mean, I, a lot of people know this about me, but I'm going to go back to the email list thing. And mm -hmm. you can also do a text club, right? Because though that's the data you own and control. Mm. And a lot of, I've, I've, I've talked about this before, but... Um, and I obviously I'd say it in front of her. Um, that started when I started working with the Dresden Dolls in like 2002. This was way before we were talking about email lists. Um, you know, Amanda had this email list. Uh, it was before they had a team, and that's how she communicated with her audience about shows and music and this and that. And it came out of paranoia. I think maybe the band had an attorney and a merch company and a couple and me and a couple. I mean, but I was very young. She said, what if you go away? What if my booking agent goes away? What mm. if all these fancy people go away? This is all I have. And so I've often said that an email list is an artist's retirement plan. I, I really could talk about this all day and the money and the metrics that we've made directly versus yeah. like people that built their careers on Friendster, on MySpace, even. Uh. I, you know, when I would say this a few years ago and I'd say, it's hard to believe, but Facebook could go away. Now we're in a different, you don't own any of that. The technology right. companies own it. So it's, you know, email addresses and phone numbers, data that you own and control. Emily White, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Uh, let them know where they can find you online, yeah. this camera, that camera, whichever. Okay, great. 
My name's Emily White. I'm at EM Wizzle on Twitter, and you can find my company and all that on my Twitter bio. So. Awesome, awesome. Follow Emily, check out her brand new book. We are gonna put the link in the notes at the bottom. And thank you so much for watching, and thank you for supporting us on Patreon. And if you're not a Patreon supporter yet, go to patreon.com slash Lords of the Trident. You can see the entire uncut interview, not just with Emily, but with everybody else that we've interviewed this entire weekend. And there's gonna be a lot of content coming out. So patreon.com slash Lords of the Trident. And thank you for watching. Until next time, we will see you on the internets.